Yeah, good morning. And uh, today I like to talk again about uh, the volatility calibration in our term structure model. Uh, so we already had a session on volatility, for example, the very simple observation that it's quite easy to calibrate to a caplet. Yeah, for example, if the model is in log normal form. So we are looking at our uh, discrete forward rate term structure model. So in say this general form where the volatility function is here, a local volatility function. And we also have um, a correlation model inside our model. But of course, if you consider special cases like the log normal one, you know, which is sigma i, l i, d w i, or the normal one, which is just sigma i, d w i, uh, then the question how to calibrate the sigma e is a little bit um, easier. Uh, and we discussed volatility calibration. So we are looking at calibration. But maybe as a general remark, what you learn here is more or less a general scheme. Yeah? So it applies to calibration of other models as well. Also to models that are not related to mathematical finance. Yeah? It's like finding the parameters of our uh, stochastic process. And looking at the volatility, when we talk about calibration, okay, maybe that as a general remark, calibration is how to choose the parameters of the model such that the evaluation matches, for example, observed prices. We were asking, okay, how's the relation to swaption? What are swaption telling us about our model parameters? And we made a very nice observation, namely that there is almost a one-to-one -one relation or say maybe dependency yeah, of the swaption prices on the forward rate volatilities. And the reason is maybe contained in the following picture, which we had already discussed a little bit in, uh, in detail. Um, the swaption is an option on the swap. And the value of a swap at a future point in time, so that is here our time when we exercise the swaption. So I look at the value of the swap at this exercise time. The value of the swap can be seen as a function of some forward rates. So we have here the forward rates, Li, Li plus one, Li plus two. Uh, so you just look at which model quantities, so these here are the model quantities, enter into the valuation. And we were asking for model parameters. So the model parameters that determine the behavior of these model quantities, if we look at volatility, are here the sigma i, of t, where the little t ranges from t0 to the exercise state ti. Okay, obvious from the picture, because then the swaption is exercised. So the value of the swap is determined at this point. So we do not care about what is the sigma parameter after that time. And the endpoint of the swap, so that is here the Tj, well, this endpoint determines how many forward rates enter into the valuation of the swap. So the last one is the one from Tj minus one to Tj. And obviously, if you now modify the beginning of the swap, so you look at the swap rate over a certain period in the future. If you now modify the beginning and say, you look at that a little bit later, for example, here, then there is one additional sigma parameter entering into the game. So you have 
suddenly uh, an additional dependency here on that guy. Of course, also that one here, yeah. So we have here multiple parameters entering into the game, but we also have multiple swaps at which we may look at because we have swaps with different ending times. So for each swap with an ending time, we can use here one of these guys to calibrate them. And if you make the swap uh, a little bit longer, yeah, so if you change the ending time here, of course, then you also get here another sigma parameter entering. So you see that um, there is uh, enough degrees of freedom to maybe fit all the swaptions. But that was all uh, for the first part uh, that we discussed about uh, the calibration. And apart from that, you can view calibration as just an optimization problem. Choose the parameter such that the calibration error, so the distance of the model quantities from the observed quantities becomes minimal. And that's maybe already the remark for our next section, the analytic evaluation of the swaption. So I would like to derive now an analytic formula of the swaption value in terms of my forward rate parameters. So why do I have an interest in an analytic formula, an analytic evaluation formula? So the calibration problem can be understood as a minimization problem. So I have a set of model parameters. For example, my sigma i in the previous picture, yeah, the volatility parameters. Then that is feed it into a model. And using that model, I perform evaluation of some financial products, which we maybe call the calibration products. And for these products, I can now calculate the difference of what my model is calculating and what we observe as a target value on the market. And that defines the calibration error. And I would like to minimize this calibration error. So if it is, if you like to solve it to equal to zero, then we are like, uh, actually uh, looking for an inversion of this function. So we have a certain function that maps here model parameters to values, calibration errors. If we maybe have more financial products than we have parameters, okay, then there is no inversion, but we like to minimize, choose the optimal parameters, minimize this error. And the observation we just made is that it looks as if we have many parameters to actually fit almost all uh, swap chains. Yeah. So uh, volatility parameter is a good candidate to calibrate uh, the swap chain prices. So if you perform this um, minimization here through a numerical method, for example, some optimizer, gradient descent, or whatever you have yeah, to perform this minimization, to solve this minimization problem, then this means that you iterate often through this function. So you call it very often. So it means that you would like to have that this function executes fast. And the slow part in this function is of course the evaluation of the model value. Yeah? So you can think, for example, that we perform this by a full Monte Carlo simulation with 10,000 or 50,000 Monte Carlo sample paths. Okay, then this is an expensive, expensive uh, part. So I would like to make this fast. So making that fast means I would like to have an analytic formula. And let's exercise this for a swaption. 
Okay, I give you one example how we can derive such an analytic formula. We like to derive evaluation formula for swaptions. We like to derive an analytic valuation formula for swaptions, assuming a log normal model. Okay, now you say, okay, I already have this. This is just black model for the swaption. Yeah? Log normal swap rate, I have an analytic formula. The issue is that we assume a log normal model for the forward rate. And the problem is, the swaption is a function of the forward rate, but it is a nonlinear function of the forward rate. Uh, even if it would be a linear function, uh, the sum of log normals is not log normal. So it's not clear what is the distribution of the swap rate. So we do not have an analytic formula. No? We have a log normal model for L. So what's the analytic formula for this function? So it's possible to derive an analytic formula. Well, to be precise, it is possible to derive an approximation formula. I have to perform an approximation step uh, in between. And again, what you see here is more or less uh, a general scheme. Yeah. So many analytic approximation formulas are derived in that way. The first step is, do we know an analytic formula for valuing a swaption? Yes, we do know an analytic uh, formula for valuing a swaption. For example, we know black formula, assuming a log normal swap rate. And at this point, you have to ask yourself, um, okay, do you know an analytic formula for valuing the swaption under a model that is close to the model I have? So to my given model. Uh, so which model is close? You, we also have the Bachelier formula for the swaption, assuming a normal dynamic for the swap rate. We had the black formula for a swaption, assuming a log normal model for the swap rate. So which one should I, should I choose? So this step is already a crucial part because you would like to find um, a model for which you have analytic formulas that is close to the one that you have. Uh, the step here is if the forward rates are log normal, then the forward rates are all positive. Yeah? So non-negative. Um, so then the swap rate will be non-negative. So maybe a log normal model for the swap rate is a good choice. And if I would start with a normal model for the forward rates, then maybe I would like to look at a normal model for the swap rates. So uh, you have to already select the model that, that fits well. So find a, a simplified model here for our uh, swap rate underlying. So this underlying here is my swap rate for which we do know an analytic formula. Next step is write down the dynamic, so the stochastic process of the underlying that is relevant for that formula. So here the swap rate, write down this stochastic process in terms of my given model quantities. So this is in terms of my forward rate model. So how can I do that? Okay, if one object, the swap rate can be expressed in terms of the other object as a function, then it's just Ito's lemma that allows me to write the stochastic process for the swap rate. So this is the DS I'm looking at in terms of the DL. Yeah, it's Ito's lemma. Surely the DS will not be the black model for the swap chain, yeah? because if forward rate is log normal, swap rate is likely not log normal. So, but now you can add some approximation step, steps. So can you express the model parameters of the simplified model 
So this is the swap rate model, my simplified model in terms of the parameters of my given model, so my forward rate model. And here is a step where you are allowed to do some approximations. And then you have done the mapping of one parameter set to the other parameter set. Let's exercise that for this function. First, we call that uh, the swap rate can be expressed in terms of zero copper bonds. Yeah, so we know that. So we can express here the swap rate in terms of zero copper bonds. So we have the bond at the beginning of the swap minus the end, uh, the bond at the end of the swap divided by the swap annuity, which is also um, a function of a zero copper bond. And all the zero copper bonds are in turn uh, functions of the forward rates. So this is the product up to I minus one, one plus LJ delta TJ, well, inverse. Yeah. So you see that, is that these are the forward rates. <clears throat> well, the beginning of this product here is at the time T, yeah, so the evaluation time. And also there's the short period bond in front here, but that's not so important. Okay, you see that here my forward rates enter. And in that sense, the swap rate is now a function of the forward rate. So I have this um, relation. So now let's go to the step where we apply Ito's lemma. If you write down the swap rate as some function of, and now let's be a little bit uh, sloppy with the notation. I call the function also S A B. Yeah? So actually yeah, maybe I should use a different symbol. So this is now a function of some forward rates. And we know from this picture, we already know that only several forward rates enter into this swap rate, namely the forward rate from TA, the starting point in this picture TI, to TB minus one, uh, or to, to TB, then the end of the period in this picture TJ. So here I can already write that this depends on the forward rate LA, LA plus one, and so on up to LB minus one T. So the swap rate is a function of these forward rates. Then I can apply Ito's lemma to this function. So applying Ito's lemma, I can rewrite now the swap rate process. DS is differentiate the function with respect to LK times DLK. And then the second order term differentiate the function twice with respect to two arguments times the differentials of the two arguments. Huh? One half, yeah, depending how you write this sum here. Yeah? So now plug in the definition of the DLKs to look at how does the swap rate process look under my forward rate model. But before I do this plug in, let's rewrite this a little bit because I would like to have a log normal model. I would like to have a log normal model here for the parameter of here for the for the S. So that means I would like to have something that looks like S sigma dW. Okay, so I would like to have this looking like that. So that means I would like to have here in front an SAB, the swap rate. So let's just do that, okay? Just right here in front, an SAB. The DWs are just inside here. You see here is the DW is a, is a Brownian increment. So that guy 
the DLK will contain a Pauline increment. Yeah, you see it's here. Uh, so let's write just a, a swap rate in front to have it looking like a log normal model. That means I have to divide here by the swap rate, this uh, coefficient. Apart from that, this guy here is just the coefficient that we had from Ito's lemma. So then plug in the definition of the L, so my original model. So my original model is the forward rate. I plug that in here. Okay, so DLK, I get an LK sigma K DWK. So we get this part. So now you know that the sum of normals is a normal, and sum of independent normals is a normal, yeah? and also here the correlated one, it's uh, not, a, not, a, not an issue. So uh, we have a sum of Brownian increments. We would like to see one Brownian increment, but apart from that, we are maybe already there. So we have something that looks a little bit like a log normal model, DS is S times some stuff DW. So this some stuff is here, this part. But you see, it's not black model for the swap chain because here the coefficient that is in front of the DW, which is this part here, this guy is stochastic. You see there is, for example, here it's dif differentiate the swap rate with respect to the forward rate, again, also divided by the swap rate. All these guys are random variables. So this here is a stochastic quantity. So this stuff here, let's call it W, this stuff is stochastic. Okay, you can write this W a little bit nicer, it's differentiate the swap rate with respect to the forward rate divided by the swap rate. This is differentiate the logarithm of the swap rate and then multiply it with the forward rate. Okay, this is actually differentiate the logarithm of the swap rate with respect to the logarithm of the forward rate. But that's just a little bit rewriting. So now, how does this relate to our log normal model? Okay, that's the model we have under the forward rate. This is the model we would like to have to, to apply our uh, analytic formula. So in the model we would like to have, okay, we also have here the coefficient S. And then we have a nice thing. There is here just a constant parameter sigma AB. Uh, which is allowed to de depend on time, which is the instantaneous volatility of the log swap rate. And if we have that parameter, if we know how this guy looks like, then I can use the analytic formula, then I can use the plaque formula to value the swap chain. Uh, if you know a stochastic process, how do you, do you get this parameter? Well, this parameter is just the quadratic uh, variation of the logarithm of the swap rate. So because if you just divide here by this SIB, yeah, this, this swap rate, you see that DS divided by S is sigma DW. And now if you take the square of this, yeah, so that is here DS divided by S multiplied with ds divided by s, then you have that this is just sigma squared dw dw sigma squared dt. So we have that the parameter we are looking for is just the quadratic variation of log of s. So for the black scholes formula, I need the integral of that. Yeah, so you know, need the integral of that. So I need the integral of this quadratic variation. So actually the thing I'm looking for is the integral of this stuff here up to 
where the swap chain exercises. Yeah, this is nice because now I can express the thing I need for my analytic formula in terms of uh, the stochastic process here. And I know the stochastic process under my forward rate model. Now, because that is here the stochastic process of the swap rate under my forward rate model. So question, what is the quadratic variation of the log of the swap rate assuming this model? Huh? So let's just calculate the ds divided by s squared, assuming this stochastic process. So we just plug in the previous slide in this slide, and I get that I have ds divided by s squared is the sum over all k and l, wk, wl, sigma k, sigma l, rho k l, dt. Okay, where do we see that? Well, if you divide by the s, this guy goes away. This guy is canceled. So it's just the squared of this. Well, dt, dt is zero anyway. So it's just multiply this with itself. So I have two sums k from a to b minus one, and maybe call the other one l from a to b minus one. And then you just use that dwk dwl is rho k l dt. So you have wk sigma k wl sigma l rho k l dt. Well, that's nice. Very nice expression for what we would like uh, to have for our plaque formula. So it, we see that this here is the part that should correspond. So this sum is the part that should correspond to the sigma, sigma s a b squared of t. And again, you see that uh, this object is stochastic. Well, we have um, a log normal forward rate where these guys here are deterministic. They are nice, but this guy, these two guys here, they are stochastic. So a log normal forward rate model will lead to a log normal swap rate model with a stochastic volatility huh? function. Um, so the weights W, they are stochastic. But if you go back to the definition of the weights, the definition of the weights, they are here the differentiate the swap rate with respect to the forward rate. And if you go back to maybe the definition of the swap rate, well, you see that the swap rate is just something like an average of the forward rates. And this object is yeah, fairly constant. It's something like um, a one divided by n. Yeah. So actually uh, the relation of the time fractions in the time discretization, but if the time discretization is an equidistant time discretization, it's like a one divided by n. So this weight is stochastic. It depends a little bit which interest rates are high or low. But it's, it's not so much uh, moving. And that's the helpful thing. That's the reason why our model is still close to the model with a constant log normal volatility for the swap rate. So this motivates a little bit now the approximation. So the crucial approximation step yeah, is that we use these weights just not of t, we use them of zero, so the initial values, and then everything becomes deterministic, so we can approximate this. 
So the integral of the stuff that you see on the end of that slide is the square of the plaque shoals implied volatility. Well, in addition, multiplied with T with time because you have to time average it, but that's the quantity we need. Okay, so if you then finally divide here by times, you integrate it and you divide by times, then you are done. So last remark, to implement this in the computer, I need the weights. Yeah? So calculating here, this, uh, this part here is maybe easy. So if the volatility and correlation are constant, yeah, then there's not even an integral here. Uh, if the volatility and correlation are piecewise constant, then this integral here becomes a sum. Yeah, so that's, that's maybe easy. So what we need uh, as a last step is these weights WK, WL. So how are these weights? Okay, so the weight can be written as the differential of the logarithm of the swap rate with respect to the logarithm of the forward rate, or if we write it back, it is the differentiate the logarithm of the swap rate with respect to the forward rate, multiply with the forward rate. And if you then plug in the definition of the swap rate, so this here is just the definition of the swap rate, then you see that you have to differentiate a logarithm or a function of zero Cooper bonds. Well, differentiating the logarithm is of a ratio is differentiate the logarithm of this difference. So I can make use of the logarithm here. Okay, differentiating the logarithm is then differentiating what's inside divided by what's inside. So I have that we get finally this nice expression here, where you see that we are always just differentiating zero Cooper bonds. Okay, we are just differentiating zero Cooper bonds with respect to the forward rate. So now the zero Cooper bond at a certain time. So what time do I use? Maybe I use now a TL. Uh, that's okay. There's maybe a short period bond here in front and then I have a product and then it's one plus L. Let me use I here and L there. Okay, the L runs to I minus one delta TL. Uh, yeah, this is a zero Cooper bond. So if you draw uh, some timeline, this is a zero Cooper bond that, uh, oh, by the way, this is to the power of minus one. This is a zero Cooper bond that matures here in TI. So you have here forward rates before that guy. And now I would like to differentiate this guy with respect to LK. Well, if you differentiate the to the power of minus one, you get one divided by uh, LL delta TL to the power of two multiplied with the inner derivative. The inner derivative is just the time fraction. And in addition, I get a minus, uh, a minus one from here. But I only get this if the K is smaller than I. Because if the K is larger than I, then the forward rate is here and it does not enter into the zero Cooper bond. So I have two cases for this differentiation. If the K is after the maturity of the zero Cooper bond, then I get zero. Otherwise I get minus the same expression divided by one plus LK delta TK multiplied with the inner derivative TK. So we get this nice expression here for this derivative. And then you plug this in and you have found the weight.
okay, so you can rewrite this rate in a little bit more elegant way if you introduce the swap annuities. Yeah, actually, the rate is uh, simplified to this expression here. And this expression also has a nice feature. We had this feature before. Uh, you can now iteratively calculate the weight um, and reuse parts of the previous calculation yeah because you see there are similar parts and they just get an additional uh, different factor here so you can use this form here to speed up uh, your code so summary analytic approximation of a swap chain under a log normal model uh, we calculate here the integrated instantaneous covariance using here this product WK, WL, Sigma K, Sigma L, Rho KL. And if you now introduce, say, this matrix here, well, this matrix here is just the covariance matrix. Well, it's the integrated instantaneous covariance matrix. Then you see that this here is just a quadratic form. This here is just, if you, if you call this matrix here, say, let's call it C, yeah, because C is maybe for covariance matrix. Then you see that what we calculate is just the quadratic form the vector of the weights, let's call this here the vector of the weights, transposed C W. Okay, so maybe at zero. And that's actually uh, now um, a very nice view on this. C is the covariance matrix of the forward rates and W is the vector that tells you where does the swap rate change if the forward rate changes. Yeah. Actually, here in this picture, everything on the logarithm, the C is the covariance matrix of the logarithms, and the W is how does the logarithm of the swap rate changes if the logarithm of the forward rate changes. So it's exactly the um, the projection or the, the right uh, direction. It's the variance uh, of my, my vector, given that I have the covariance matrix of the basis system. And it's a very general scheme that we have derived. Okay, so that's uh, this remark that you can express this as a covariance matrix. And um, the approxim approximation that we made was that we were just using here the weights in zero. Sometimes this is called freezing the drift, yeah, this technique. Okay, this term is maybe a bit confusing. In the script, you find the same derivation for the normal model. It's just the same steps. You start with the normal model for the forward rate. Then you say, okay, the model that is close is a normal model for the swap rate. You try to link it to Bachelier formula using a normal model for the swap rate. Then the quadratic variation is now just the quadratic variation of the swap rates, not of the logarithm of the swap rates. And you can express the quadratic variation now in the same terms. The weights are also approximated in zero. This is the integrated instantaneous covariance. Yeah, so the integrated instantaneous quadratic variation here. The weights are now different, not the derivative of the logarithm, just the derivative of the swap rate with respect to the forward rate, but very similar formula. And uh, plugging this in, you get also a nice expression in terms of the annuities, and you are done. Uh, let me at five minutes and conclude with a small numerical experiment. I started by motivating this analytic derivation here by making this part here fast. And in the code, yeah, uh, I have in this experiments project here um, a small 
code that performs a calibration. It's in a calibration of at the money swaption, therefore ATM here. Um, well, it performs this calibration using a brute force Monte Carlo calculation and the analytic formula. And let's see how they compare and how the errors are. So you find this code here. So the experiment I would like to do now is to look at uh, how these guys uh, perform. So you find this in our experiments repository in Monte Carlo interest rates here in Liber Market Model calibration ATM test. And you see that um, there I specify different scenarios. I'm always using now the normal model. You can also look at the log normal one. And I perform calibration using the Monte Carlo product. So this is put force Monte Carlo calibration or the analytic formula. And there is a funny subtle aspect. We will talk about implementation maybe in another session that when you use um, an, a financial product that has an analytic formula, so this product does not need future forward rates, then the lazy initialization will not create the simulation. So this one here will go way faster. Then you can specify how many Monte Carlo path I use to calibrate this. Well, this is only relevant if you have a Monte Carlo simulation. And then you can specify how many Monte Carlo paths should be used to check the calibration. And you see that I'm sometimes calibrating with a different number of, uh, of paths and then checking with a higher number of paths. Uh, so if you run this, this takes a quite long time. So maybe you can reduce here the number if, you, if, if it is uh, too time consuming for you. So that's a bit bit very slow now, uh, very, very small, but just to demo you that there is some output coming out. If you now run this program, you see that he's telling you the parameters and then he's performing the calibration. Okay, the analytic one is actually independent of reducing the number of Monte Carlo path. And you see that he's printing the errors the calibration error and then benchmarking it again yeah, with another product under maybe possible different path. And you see that if you use here these products to calibrate, of course, the numerical minimization will find the optimal solution so that the mean is zero. Yeah? So this here is the minimized error. It will find the optimal solution. But if you then check with a financial product that was not used during calibration, namely the Monte Carlo product, then you see that there is still an error in this other product. So question, is this here now the approximation error we have in our analytic formula? Yeah? We are using the analytic formula for calibration. And then if, you, you, if we use the Monte Carlo evaluation, then we see, okay, it is not, not uh, not minimized. Let's have a look at this. And I prepared the results because it takes quite a, a while to generate these results. I repaired these here on the slides and let's conclude with this. The first thing is I'm using an analytic formula to perform the calibration. So this means that the calibration is minimizing this quantity here. Then if you perform the benchmark using a Monte Carlo product, and I use now 1000 Monte Carlo paths, then you see that, okay, there's still a quite a significant error here. So is this due to the fact that we used the analytic product? Well, what we could do is we could also do a Monte Carlo product for the calibration. So yeah, then I get a different minimization error here. And then, of course, if I just benchmark the result, I see, okay, I have um, a perfect uh, fit here. 
in my Monte Carlo. But unfortunately, the Monte Carlo takes here one minute while the analytic formula just take, took six seconds. Okay, there's other stuff going around, yeah, but I have a factor of 10 of improvement. Well, if you increase the number of sample paths in the benchmark, so now the important thing is that in the benchmark, I increase the number of sample paths, then you see that also calibrating with the Monte Carlo product is resulting in a large difference. Yeah. So the effect that was happening here is that we just calibrated perfectly to the numerical error because there is a numerical error in the Monte Carlo valuation. So we have two different bad things. There is an approximation error in the analytic formula and there is a numerical error in the Monte Carlo valuation. And our calibration is perfectly fitting to the error. And at this point, yeah, you see that it's not, not clear which one of the two is better. That's an interesting thing. Yeah? At this point, it's not clear which one of the two is better. Of course, if you use the Monte Carlo with 1,000 sample passes to perform your valuation, then it's maybe a good thing to have removed the numerical error by calibration. Maybe that's a good thing, but if you calibrate with a lower number of sample paths and then perform the valuation with a higher number of sample paths, maybe you have calibrated to the wrong value. You have calibrated to a numerical error. And to get a feeling now, how good is our analytic approximation? I have to increase the number of sample paths significantly. So, if I now make the same exercises with the 10,000 path, you see that your calibration is reducing the error to an 0.006%, which is small. And if you then benchmark with a Monte Carlo simulation that has 10,000 sample paths, you see that your calibration is not so bad. Yeah, it's 0 0.008. So the impression that our analytic formula has a large error in the previous slides was only due to our Monte Carlo simulation having a large error. Well, that's an interesting thing. And you can even uh, more increase it. Say you now calibrate a Monte Carlo with 10,000 sample paths. So now I'm calibrating here with Monte Carlo and 10,000 sample paths. And I'm benchmarking it with 50,000 sample paths. And you get a similar, a similar error here as before, 0 0.08. So from that, I would say that our analytic formula is, well, as good as a Monte Carlo with 10,000 sample paths. Okay, so you see that if you now benchmark here with 50,000, then you see that the analytic formula has an error. So here you see it, but um, the analytic formula is quite good. That's it for today. Thanks.